Good morning. We have general questions. Question number one, in the name of Gordon MacDonald, has been withdrawn. The member has provided me with an explanation. Question number two, Jim Eady. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many representations it has received calling for the Craig House Development Planning Application to be called in. Minister Derek Mackay. I can advise the member 303 such representations have been received as of 1st of October. Jim Eady. The proposal to build on the Craig House site, one of the seven hills of Edinburgh, contravenes Scottish planning policy in relation to enabling development, as any development should be the minimum necessary to prevent the loss of the asset and secure its long-term future. Given the national significance of this site, its A-listed buildings and unique wildlife and biodiversity, does he not agree that the decision taken is of such national importance, setting as it does a dangerous precedent for other valuable sites in Scotland, as to justify calling in this planning application, will he now do so? Minister. I should firstly emphasise that the general principle under which the planning system in Scotland operates is that decisions should be taken at the most appropriate local administrative level, unless there are compelling reasons for taking them at a higher level. The impacts of this application are local to the Craig House area of Edinburgh and do not raise issues of national importance that would merit Scottish ministers calling in the application. And I will write to the member later today outlining further detail on this. I do not believe uh, planning applications set precedent because each case is taken on their individual merits. I would, however, remind the member that whilst the Planning Authority have approved this application, there are still outstanding planning obligations, Section 75 agreement, to be agreed. Alison Johnson. Thank you. Um, given that all seven local councillors objected and spoke at the planning hearing, the local MP, local MSPs and a record number of public objections were received, over 1,200, is it not time that this Parliament looked seriously at third party right of appeal? I'll also write to Alison Johnston, who's also been very vocal uh, on the matter, as well as uh, Mr uh, Eady. Uh, it's my view, and it's actually been the view of, of Parliament in taking forward planning reform, that the legislation is broadly in the right place. And, of course, when previously considered by Parliament, third-party right of appeal it was not approved, not supported, and I have no immediate plans uh, to reconsider that. But, of course, I do want greater and stronger engagement from the public in the planning process. Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does the Minister not agree that the problem is, the precedent is, that it's, it's building on green space, and this is what we're trying to avoid in Edinburgh? And there have been so many objections from all parties that I would have thought this was a, a, a matter for to have it called in. Minister? Uh, no, I would say again to Mr uh, Buchanan that uh, in terms of planning, one application does not set uh, a precedent for others. Every case has to be considered uh, with all the material considerations at hand and due process, and therefore it won't set a precedent. By all means, those who have uh, objected may not be happy with the local authority's decision, but I would emphasise again, I do not have adequate grounds in which I believe it would be appropriate to call this in. It is a matter for the local authority uh, to determine. And as I say again, it's not completely uh, complete in that the Section 75 agreement has still to be agreed. Question number three, Jamie Hepburn. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is in reports that the Barnet formula will be reduced by the UK Government over time. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Officer, the Scottish Government is clear that the continuation of the Barnet allocation of resources represents an integral component of the vow made by the leaders of the Conservative, Labour and Liberal Democrat parties in the run-up to the referendum. We will continue to represent the best interests of the people of Scotland by holding these parties to account for the promises that were made. Jamie Hepburn. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary mentions uh, the uh, commitment made in the so-called vow. Does he therefore share my concern that in the Westminster motion published on the 22nd of September uh, regarding devolution, there was no uh, mention made of funding despite uh, this vow. And does he agree with me that any enhanced devolution settlement must not disadvantage Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President, I think, it's, I think it's the observation that Mr Hepburn makes is absolutely correct, that it was, uh, I think, a, an issue that caused concern that with the vow having had such prominence during the referendum campaign, 
that the reference to the continuation of the Barnet allocation of resources was absent from the parliamentary motion that was tabled in the House of Commons. Quite clearly, the Scottish Government works at all times to ensure that the financial arrangements that support the Scottish Parliament are maintained in the interests of the people of Scotland. That is exactly what we will do in all of our, what we do in our current negotiations around the implementation of the Scotland Act 2012, and which we will continue to do in the uh, discussions around any further powers in the years to come. Malcolm Chisholm. I, mean, I think we're all agreed on the Baronet formula, but does he accept that this is a political decision and that we do have uh, an undertaking from all the relevant political leaders uh, in the UK? And does he also agree that with uh, uh, further fiscal devolution, which we also uh, all uh, support, uh, this will not be such a heated issue in England, since the, the, the Barnett principle can still be followed, but obviously the grant to Scotland with more fiscal devolution will not be such a major part uh, of public expenditure in the UK. Well, well if, I, if I could just explain to Mr, uh, to Mr Chisholm, if we take, for example, the Scotland Act 2012, the devolution of financial responsibilities that we are currently uh, addressing um, will result in the uh, devolution of the tax base of approximately one and a half percent of the block grant of the that the Scottish government, uh, the Scottish Parliament currently receives from the United Kingdom Bank. So we have to keep a, a question of scale about all these points. I think it's important that the, uh, and this is where I agree with Mr. Chisholm, that the commitments that were given in advance of the referendum, which included the continuation of the Barnet allocation of resources, um, it is maintained and maintained without question. And that's the view that I take in relation to the discussions I'm having about the block grant adjustment in relation to the Scotland Act 2012 and what will underpin the government's attitude towards any further devolution in the years to come. Annabel Gould. Presiding officer, given that the main adjustment to the amounts received under Barnet will be consequent upon this Parliament being given increased powers to raise income tax, what will the Scottish Government's priorities be in relation to income tax? Will it be to lower tax rates or to increase tax rates? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I, I'll certainly uh, happily set out to Parliament uh, next Thursday the first tax rates that will ever have been set by a France minister in Scotland when I set land and buildings transaction tax and landfill tax. Um, that is, of course, the appropriate moment for Parliament to be told about the tax rates. And um, obviously, <coughs> uh, parliamentary announcements will be made on the uh, levels of income tax that will be set in Scotland at the appropriate budget opportunities in relation to the devolution of responsibilities that come from the Scotland Act 2012. Question four, Elaine Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Dumfries and Galloway Council regarding its role in the proposed National Resilience Centre in Dumfries. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. On 14th of August, I visited Dumfries to launch the new National Centre for Resilience. This will largely operate on a network basis, but will have a physical presence at the Crichton Centre from where it will be coordinated. The leader of Dumfries and Galloway Council, other elected members and officials of the Council and representatives of other partner organisations join me to welcome uh, this exciting new initiative. What I announced uh, was the concept, which has been warmly welcomed by the resilience community. The centre will be up and running in 2015-16 and we are continuing to work with key partners such as Dumfries and Galloway Council to enable the centre to develop a work programme that will help emergency responders and others to increase resilience and preparedness at national and community level. Elaine Murray. I, I thank the Minister for his response but he will be aware that Dumfries and Galloway Council are keen to meet with him and his officials to actually discuss how they can take this forward. The process for establishing the centre has been described as a four-stage process and I wonder if the Minister can advise which stage the process is now at and what timeline he anticipates for the launch of the Centre uh, for Research and Resilience in Scotland. Minister. Um, th thank you for, to, to uh, Dr Murray for her interest in the subject. I know it's obviously an important one for her constituents. Um, in terms of the next steps, we, we are in discussion with partners and stakeholders on the project management arrangements for the centre uh, and the initial project meetings will take place later this month, so hopefully we'll get some progress in the course of the month. Uh, separately, the Scottish Funding Council clearly are looking at the research opportunities and uh, are taking sort of consultation on uh, how that has progressed uh, and happy to keep the member informed of, of that uh, through, through Mr Russell and, and other colleagues as, as that progresses. But um, I would say that uh, we would hope to have this up and running in as early as possible in 2015-16, depending on the nature of uh, obviously human resource issues and, and an appointment of key personnel. Uh, but I think it is an exciting opportunity for Dumfries and I think Dumfries has a very important role to play in the future of resilience in Scotland. Question number five, Chick Brodie. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Treasurer and the implications 
for the budget, Scotland's budget from 2016-17 to 2020-21 of the UK government efforts to reduce its debt of £1.57 trillion as it will be at the end of 2016. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Officer, it's estimated that the Scottish Government's resource to our budget could be lower by around £4 billion in 2018-19 than when the current UK Government came to office in 2010-11 as a result of the £25 billion of cuts projected by the Chancellor in the March budget. That would represent a potential real terms reduction to Scotland's resource to our budget of approximately 15 per cent over that period. The Scottish Government has financial information from the UK Government um, up to the financial year 2015-16 but does not have any detailed financial information for thereafter. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The, the IFS report produced the day after the referendum indicated that the UK Government plan had been that public sector net debt should fall as a share of national income. The report, however, showed that the latest forecast from the Government's own OBR suggests that the target will be missed and the latest forecast for UK public finances imply further deep cuts to public service spending of £37.6 billion between 2015-16 to 2018-2019, that on top of £8.7 billion already set out for 2015-16. I'm not sure if there's a question, Cabinet Secretary, Sorry, but would you like control. to go? Uh, well, President the, 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 I think the, the information that um, Mr Brody uh, raises um, is uh, important information about the future of public expenditure in the United Kingdom and the effects that it will have on Scotland. Uh, clearly, the um, messages that we have heard over the course of the last couple of weeks from both the Shadow Chancellor and the Chancellor indicate that a prolonged period of um, uh, public expenditure reductions and austerity um, will be implicit whether there is a Conservative or Labour government elected after the 2015 United Kingdom general election. And accordingly, that will apply very significant uh, difficulties and challenges for public expenditure and public services in Scotland. Question number six in the name of George Adam has been withdrawn for perfectly understandable reasons. Question number seven, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it monitors how the educational outcomes for looked after children in kinship care placements compares with those of children in residential or foster care. Cabinet Secretary Michael Ross. Standing officer, generally tariff scores of children in kinship care, that is with friends or relatives, are higher than those in residential care, but lower than those in foster care. However, the, I should say that the data is subject to large fluctuations due to the very small numbers of children in these categories. Billy Coffey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? I, I certainly know that the data samples are small and subject to these fluctuations. Uh, but there does appear to be a significant difference, uh, for example, in educational outcomes between looked after children at home and those who live away from home. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary give me an assurance that looked after children can have access to the same learning support services, no matter where they may be looked after? Cabinet Secretary. There has been a, a presiding officer a very keen focus on improving the outcomes for looked after children, which have been far too low for far too long. We're seeing some significant advances in the work done with looked after children, and that is producing far better outcomes for them. But none of us in this chamber will rest until those outcomes are as good as for other children. And it is important that we continue to support and resource a variety of schemes, including some very innovative schemes in Glasgow that are actually making a difference to looked after children. Question number eight, Alex Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what preparations it has made to deal with any Ebola outbreak. Minister Michael Matheson. Uh, the Scottish Government has been working closely with Health Protection Scotland to minimise the risk of an outbreak of Ebola virus in Scotland, and I have met with experts from Health Protection Scotland to discuss these issues. The NHS in Scotland already has well established effective protocols for dealing with highly infectious diseases. But updated and revised professional guidance for healthcare workers has been issued in light of this outbreak. In particular, GP practitioners and frontline healthcare workers have been advised that they must be extra vigilant when dealing with patients who have recently travelled to affected areas. Scottish Government officials continue to take part in weekly UK teleconferences to monitor the outbreak and level of preparedness. And Scottish Government officials are also uh, directly involved with regular international teleconferences to ensure we have the most up-to-date information. 
the level of risk posed to Scotland by Ebola continues to be very low, but we are not complacent and will respond accordingly if the risk increases. Alex Johnson. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. I understand that this week the news from uh, outbreaks in Nigeria is actually good and that the level of infection may be falling. However, has the Government made any specific assessment of danger attached to the movement which exists between Nigeria and the northeast of Scotland related to the oil and gas industry? And are there any specific preparations for uh, changing the status should any risk be identified? Minister. I think the member makes a, a good point. There has been some progress made in some of the affected countries. However, there are other countries where the risk continues to increase, uh, and therefore we must be very vigilant uh, in how we continue to deal with this uh, matter. I can inform the member that Health Protection Scotland have been engaging with the oil industry in the northeast of Scotland, particularly to look at potential risk of workers who are operating within the west coast of Afri Africa and have been discussing with them a range of measures that they should consider taking forward in order to make sure that their personnel are properly protected, but equally that they also have appropriate measures in place to ensure that those individuals, when they return to uh, Scotland, have the appropriate support, if necessary, should they find themselves unwell when they return. Thank you. Question number nine, Neil Findlay. To ask the Scottish Government when work on the new Dunfries Hospital will commence. Secretary, Alex Presenting officer, construction of the replacement for the Dumfries and Galloway Royal Infirmary is planned to commence in spring 2015. Procurement work and development of the business case are ongoing. A major milestone was reached recently as the NHS Dumfries and Galloway announced the preferred bidder for the project. Neil, Neil Findlay. On this project and the Aberdeen Bypass and the new Dundee D Museum, we see companies who have been up to their necks in blacklisting, securing public contracts without taking any remedial action to own up, apologise or pay up to the victims. Given the assurances we were given during the passage of the Public Procurement Bill, why is this still happening and will the new guidance have any impact? Cabinet Secretary. The presenting officer, the Scottish Government's opposition to blacklisting was made clear in guidance issued in November 2013, which was developed in partnership with a number of trade unions. This gave public bodies new pre-qualification questions, as well as a new contract clause to allow the contracts of those who blacklist to be terminated. The contractual uh, provisions within the project agreement in relation to the hospital, currently drafted for non-profit distribution procurement, uh, may be, which is being used for the hospital, for the new uh, hospital state that all bidders must fully comply with all prevailing legislation in relation to procurement and employment matters in force at the award of the contract, including those provisions that relate to blacklisting. Alex Ferguson. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary, uh, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary is aware that many of my constituents in, in, the, in the west of my constituency, particularly Stranra, are very concerned that as the development of the Dumfries Hospital takes place, further rundown of services currently available through Stranra Hospital might continue. Can he give me an assurance that he will work with the local health board to ensure that the range of services currently available in Stranra continue to be continue to be available as the new hospital takes place. Presiding officer, can I just emphasise the services are not being run down in Stranraer. I do recognise the particular challenges around the accident and emergency unit. There are supposed to be six, uh, there's provision for six and a half uh, full-time equivalent accident and emergency consultants. Uh, two have actually recently been recruited and we're hoping to recruit more people to those positions. Uh, but I am fully aware of the challenges of attracting doctors to come and live and work in the Stranra area. And I'm looking at a number of options along with the health board to try to make it more attractive to get people with those qualifications and skills into the Stranra area to work specifically in the local hospital in Stranra, which is an excellent facility. Thank you. That ends general question time. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont.